Good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome to Grounded in His Promises. How you doing? This is our morning Bible study, and I'm excited that you've joined me. Oh, excuse me, live here on TikTok, and uh, we've uploaded this uh, to YouTube. If you're watching on YouTube, this will be up on YouTube. And if you're watching on YouTube, we did this earlier, 7 a.m. Eastern uh, Standard Time. What's happening, Daniel? What up, my man? What's up, Dan? Hey, Lindsay. Hey, Bridgie. How you doing? Good to see everyone logging in. I'm on time this morning. Yesterday, I was I was a little behind. Sorry about that. Carol, good morning. How are you? Bad Whiskey, good to see you. How is everyone? Morning, morning, morning. <laughs> you got it, Daniel. <laughs> you got it, my friend. <laughs> It's good to see everyone. I hope you're doing well. We're going to be jumping into Acts chapter 23 this morning, which will be great. Hey, Queen, how you doing? Miranda, how are you? Good to see everyone. Thanks so much for joining. Scott, how's it going? Let's get it, man. Let's go. <laughs> In the famous words of Tom Brady, let's go, baby. Let's go. Tammy, how you doing? Good to see everyone. It's good to see you all. Excited. Hey, this is Friday. We're kicking off the weekend, right? Uh, Paul, how you doing? Uh, Columbus, Ohio. Tam, how are you? Uh, Myra, how are you? Stephanie, Jen, so good to see everyone. Glad you are joining. Get your Bibles ready. Yesterday, we completed uh, Acts chapter 22. I loaded that one on YouTube, a little late. I had a busy day yesterday, so I couldn't get to it. I uh, finally got it up. It is up on YouTube. If you're looking for any of the previous ones, we've done 22 chapters of the book of Acts every morning, 7 a.m., a couple days we skip. Uh, they are all up on YouTube. And if you want to find the YouTube page, go to at Chip Mitchell 23 at. You have to put the at sign, put that in the search bar of the YouTube, of YouTube, and it'll come right on up. You'll have all of the previous uh, daily Bible studies as well as the book of James. So uh, after this one today, I'll upload this one later on today as well, and you'll have 23. You can share them with friends, family, go back over for your own self. Hey, Jess, how you doing? Hey, Lindsay, how are you? Uh, you can uh, share them with family members, go back through them, take notes. Hey, Sea Breeze, good morning. It's good to see everyone. Uh, so grab your Bibles. We're going to uh, recap just the, the, the tail end of Acts chapter 22. And then we're going to jump on into uh, Acts chapter 23, which will be great. So let's go to God in prayer and uh, we'll go for it. Father, thank you for the morning. Thank you for a new a day. Thank you for giving us life. Help us to navigate the troubled waters of life. Help us in our faith to focus on you and understanding that what comes our way, you are well aware. You are well aware of it and you are with us. And you guide and protect our hearts and minds. Help us as we dive into your word to gain greater insight into your text so that this transforms who we are as well. God, you're amazing. We love you. We thank you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, well, amen. It's great. We're going to be jumping into the book of Acts. Now, remember, I want to, I want to share something because there was, um, um, there, there's been, uh, some things that have gone back and forth. I've gone back and forth with some atheists, uh, on another profile page. And, and, and one of their arguments is, uh, we, we, there, there's no, we have no idea who wrote some of these things. And, and let me let me remind you what we read in Acts chapter 21. We did this a couple days ago. Paul lists out a group of names. Uh, he lists out seven different names, uh, four different groups in Acts chapter 21. And one of those names was uh, Philip the Evangelist and his four daughters. What's the significance of that? Well, he names them, but unbeknownst to him, what God would do is Philip was buried in modern day Turkey in Helopolis. Um, and he, he died there. His daughters finished their life there as well. Um, these daughters knew, uh, Papias. Who is Papias? Papias is this late, uh, first century historian. 
And Papias is the one where we gain knowledge of the names of the gospel testimonies, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Well, what's the significance of that? Well, when you look at Phil, uh, 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 Philip was a traveling buddy with the Apostle Paul, so that gives us a connection with his daughters that knew him. And his daughters could convey what everything we knew. The other thing we see in Colossians chapter 4 Paul lists another group of names. Who does he list there? He names Luke and Mark. He names these individuals, and guess where he names their connection to? Helopolis. He says, hey, these guys send you greetings. They're friends of them. So these guys all traveled through Helopolis. He names Laodicea. Well, guess what? Laodicea, you can see the hill it's on from Helopolis. I was in Helopolis. I touched to Philip's grave. I was there. I could see Laodicea. I traveled to Laodicea. It's only another five to 10 miles away. It's very close. I, I mean, I could see the, on the other side of the mountain. I'm saying 10 miles. It's only a guess. But I was there. And so this is powerful. These names connect us to a city and place where Papias, a first century, early second century historian, and he was there with them. And he writes about it. And he tells us about the writers. So Papias is a firsthand eyewitness to the writers of texts. So just know that when we're reading through some of these chapters and they list these names, write those names down and then do a little research on those names. And it's really powerful how some of them come up. So that's a little tidbit just so you know. So let's jump on into Acts chapter 22, the end of it, right? What do we see? Uh, Paul you know, he causes an uproar. Why? Because he talks about this idea of Gentiles being saved and it throws people into a frenzy and they lose their mind. So at the end of chapter 22, verse 30, it says the commander wanted to find out exactly why Paul was being accused by the Jews. So the next day he released him and ordered, ordered the chief priests and all the members of the Sanhedrin to assemble. He then brought Paul and had him stand before them. So now Paul has got to stand before the Sanhedrin along with this Roman commander to find out why is this guy causing an uproar. Well, here we are, Acts chapter 23. Paul looks straight at the Sanhedrin. He pulls them all together to meet and talk. He looks straight at the Sanhedrin and said, my brothers, here he is again. He's making an appeal to their heritage. This is a a family heritage, if you will, of Israelites, of Hebrews of Hebrews, right? He says, my brothers, I have fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day. He's like, look, man, I am I'm not against you. I, uh, I have fulfilled the law. I am not a re re rebel against the law of Moses or our traditions. That's what he's saying. Verse two, watch this. At this, the high priest Ananias ordered uh, those standing near Paul to strike him on the mouth. Bam. And then Paul said to him, God strike you, you whitewashed wall. I mean, listen to Paul. Paul, Paul goes off. He says, you whitewashed wall. You sit there to judge me according to the law, yet you yourselves violate the law by commanding that I be struck. I mean, it's, Paul is confronting them. Verse four, those who were standing near Paul said, how dare you insult God's high priest? Paul replied, brothers, I did not realize that he was the high priest. For it is written, do not speak evil about the ruler of the people. Now, this is pretty powerful. Look at Paul's humility. Paul confronts them for smacking him. He knows they are wrong biblically. He knows they are uh, doing evil. He confronts them with regards to their hypocrisy. But yet, when they say, hey, man, this is the high priest, he says, oh, I did not realize that he was the high priest. And notice what he does. He quotes from Exodus. He quotes from Exodus uh, chapter 22, verse 28. And it says, do not blaspheme God 
or curse the ruler of your people. So Paul says, well, you know, the Bible says don't blaspheme God and don't curse the ruler of God's people. Well, Ananias was the high priest and he it says, you know, don't don't curse that guy. Don't do it. And so Paul apologizes. This is really powerful because was was the guy a hypocrite? Yeah. Was this guy wanting him dead? Yeah. Did he want evil? Yeah, but he says don't do it. And Paul just humbly says, ah, I didn't realize. Now, notice what he says. I didn't realize. He, how could he not realize he was a high priest? A lot of times there were two high priests, uh, one that was uh, appointed by the Romans, and that's who this guy was. And then there's one that is appointed by the Jewish people. And, you know, the, and that, that caused a lot of tension um, the Romans would do it just because they wanted uh, to control the high priest family. And uh, those that ran the temple were Sadducees. And Sadducees were very much um, kind of like, I mean, the best way to describe it is they were in cahoots with the Roman Empire in many ways. They they ran the temple. They didn't care about anything else but the temple, and they made a lot of money through running the temple. Uh, it wasn't like they loved the Romans, you know, because they were Gentiles, but that they were their bread and butter. And so you're, you're going to see a tension between the Sadducees and the Pharisees here in this text, which is very interesting. So the Pharisees, they ran the synagogue system, and the synagogue system were these small houses, if you will, uh, where they had uh, worship, they came together to read uh, the Old Testament and be taught how to live out the Old Testament. And the Pharisees ran all of that. The Sadducees, on the other hand, they ran the temple in Jerusalem. Anything that had to deal with the temple, the sacrifices that took place there, the priesthood, all of that was run by the Sadducees. That's 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 how that was run. And there was a separation, and not only that, between the Sadducees and the Pharisees, there was a tension. There were some doctrinal tensions between the two. And we're going to see that here. So watch what happens. He says, I didn't realize it. He quotes Exodus chapter 22. He apologizes. And then watch verse 6. It says, then Paul, knowing that some of them were Sadducees and, uh, and the others Pharisees, called out in the Sanhedrin, my brothers, I am a Pharisee. So now he's saying to this group, I am a Pharisee descended from Pharisees. So in other words, it's here. it, it was in my family. This is who I am. I stand on trial because of, and now watch this, I stand on trial because of the hope of what? The resurrection from the dead. When he said this, a dispute broke out between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. Verse 8 gives you reason. The Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, and that there are e neither angels nor spirits, but the Pharisees believed all these things. So Paul knowing what's going on in there, what does he do? He says, well, I stand on trial because of what? My hope of the resurrection of the dead. And he knew that the Sadducees felt very different about resurrection than the Pharisees. And when he makes this statement, they lose their mind. <laughs> and so an, an intense debate broke out amongst the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Because why? The Sadducees did not believe in a resurrection. They, they didn't neither believe in angels nor spirits, but the Pharisees believed in all of them. And this is really tricky um, here because you're dealing now with some doctrinal issues with the people that are confronting Paul with what he's teaching. And um, the reason this is getting tricky <clears throat> is that uh, the Sadducees generally <clears throat> were the ones that really wanted Jesus dead. 
there, if you look at the Bible, it, 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 there was a lot of tension, yes, between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. There were. And, and, but the tensions really escalated with the Sadducees because they ran the temple. Remember the week leading up to Jesus' death. What was he doing? Well, he went in and turned over the tables in the temple. That that just, boy, that set them off. That set them off in ways that you cannot imagine. And then what do they do? Well, they put him to death. And now here is Paul standing in front of some of those same individuals, right? And And what is happening? Well, they're about to Likewise, want him be put to death. Now, but watch the Pharisees. And, and this gives you a, another perspective. And, and I think this is why in Jerusalem, there could be this movement, this way amongst many of the Pharisees there, because <clears throat> the Sadducees ran the temple. And as long as you're not disrupting their, their temple stuff, you 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 could you could possibly navigate these things, um, but the Sadducees ran the temple grounds. Where was Paul when he was arrested here in the temple grounds? This this again, this this it's tricky to navigate this, and you see this argument here. Now watch what happens, uh, and and some of it is because the Sadducees don't believe in what the resurrection. The Pharisees do believe in the resurrection. Now. Their belief of the resurrection and Paul's were a little different, right? But they both believed in the resurrection, so there was some common ground. They both believed in the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of God moving, right? They believed that, uh, right? And, and they believed in angels. So Paul was more in line with the Pharisees than he was with the Sadducees. The Sadducees, total contradiction in doctrinal understanding, but he had more in line with the Pharisees. And the Pharisees would just debate the interpretations of Paul's application of the biblical text. The Sadducees, no way, man, you're just wrong. And we see this. Watch what happens in verse 9 as it goes on. There was a great uproar. And some of the teachers of the law who were Pharisees, watch what they do. They stood up and argued vigorously. We find nothing wrong with this man. Do you hear this? We find nothing wrong with this man. This is what the Pharisees are arguing with. Why? Because one, Paul came from that line. But number two, the basic principles of resurrection, the Holy Spirit and angels and the scriptures that they believed and held to. The Sadducees only believe the book of the law. That's it. The five books of Moses. That's all they held to. Whereas in with um, the, the Pharisees, along with Paul, the entire Old Testament. And so when Paul speaks about the coming of the Messiah, the resurrect, the hope in the resurrection, they all were on the same page with regards to those concepts. How they played themselves out is where they had their debates with the Pharisees. And so you see the Pharisees standing up vigorously arguing. Well, what are they arguing? They say, we find nothing wrong with this man, they said. And notice what they say. What if the spirit or an angel has spoken to them? Verse 10, watch this. The dispute became so violent, the commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them. So what do we see here? Well, the Pharisees are going, this guy's not saying anything that we don't believe in. Spirit, the angels, and resurrection. But the Sadducees don't believe in the spirit, the angels, nor the resurrection. They just don't believe in it. So that's why this thing was getting absolutely crazy. Now, the Pharisees, this is blow away. They debated and argued all the time with Jesus, right? But notice what they say. We find nothing wrong with this man. And this is powerful because the Pharisees weren't Christians. They weren't Christians. They weren't disciples of Jesus. But what Paul was proposing from the biblical text, they were having a tough time arguing against it. The application that Jesus was Lord, they, they couldn't get there. Well, why? That comes through faith. That, that's a faith issue. It's no different than when you look at modern day scholarship. 
Modern day scholarship has a general consensus. Now listen to what I say here. Who uh, is considered modern day scholarship? Historic historians. These are people with PhDs. These are people that hold professorships. These are people that are published, that are uh, uh, well established in the historical community. They uh, all function under a scientific way, if you will, on how they look at history. These individuals, as well as critical scholars, who are critical scholars? These are textual critics. That's not a bad word. These are individuals that come up and examine uh, texts that are from ancient times, and they have a methodology of examining them, uh, giving proof to them. And in both of these groups, they're both atheists and theists, both atheists, agnostic, and theists. And that group, as they have studied over the course of decades, this idea of Jesus, here's what the general, the consensus is. Now listen at this. The consensus is this. Three things. One, Jesus lived and died a crucifixion. That's, that's the general consensus of all these. Now these are atheists as well. They go, no, he lived and he died a crucifixion, by crucifixion. Number two, his disciples, this is what they say, his disciples had um, uh, experiences of Jesus after the resurrection that led them to believe he had risen from the dead. That's they, many of them don't believe in a physical resurrec resurrection. They don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God, but they believe his disciples had experiences that led them to believe Jesus had risen from the dead. The third thing of general consensus of these individuals is this, that Paul was converted by an experience that he believed was a resurrected Jesus shortly, three years after his crucifixion. That is the general consensus. That So let me, <laughs> what is, but none of, not all of them believe Jesus was the son of God. This is so similar here with the Pharisees. This idea that there are textual facts, historical truths, to the argument of Jesus, to the argument of biblical teaching, of prophecy. There are truths about it. But just because we have these truths doesn't mean that someone will believe. Those critical scholars, those historians, they have a general consensus on that. But they don't all believe that Jesus was the Son of God. You go, how could they believe that these guys had... That's just the way it is. Understanding, belief in Jesus is a faith issue. It is not an evidence issue. It is not an issue of something that is tangible. Faith. It's an issue of faith, and it will always be an issue of faith. No different than these Pharisees. Look at what they say. They say they stood up, they argued uh, uh, vigorously, and what do they say? We find nothing wrong with this man. This is powerful. They find nothing wrong with him, but they don't have faith in Jesus. And that's my point today. Don't let these <laughs> people on TikTok <laughs> and social media venues. Oh, I need evidence. And they start screaming all this junk about evidence and they start mocking you. They have no idea what they're talking about. The evidence is clear. Jesus lived. Jesus died by crucifixion. His disciples had experiences of him after the crucifixion that led them to believe he was alive. And Paul likewise was converted by an experience that he had with Jesus after the resurrection that led him to believe he was alive. That's the general consensus. And you go, well, how can they believe that but not believe in Jesus? Because faith is needed to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, not evidence. So when these people look for all that, you go, I got nothing for you. It's a faith issue. And we see that in the text 
here. And these individuals date to, this is about 55, 56 AD, you know, you're talking, they're right there and they see miraculous signs and wonders, but yet they don't believe. It comes by faith and faith is not by sight. Amen. Just know that. So don't get caught up in a trap that evidence creates faith. It doesn't. It just doesn't. All right. So they argued vigilance. We find what? Nothing wrong. And listen to what they say. What if the spirit or an angel has spoken to him? See, they didn't have a problem believing in visions uh, that, that somehow he had a vision. An angel spoke to him. They had no problem that the spirit of God may have spoken to them. They had no issue with that whatsoever. Verse 10, the dispute became so violent that the commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them. This is crazy. He ordered the troops to go down, take him away from them by force, and bring him into the barracks. Verse 11, or verse 11, Acts 23. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, this is powerful. Verse 11, you've got to understand, when you look at... Um, the movement of the apostles there in the book of Acts. This is amazing that with Paul, we see something different. Many times we see an angel of the Lord. We see a vision from God with uh, Peter, right? We saw a vision from God in Acts uh, 9 when he was, uh, you know, about food sacrifice to idols. We see all that, right? But with Paul, on a number of occasions... It says the Lord stood near him, or the Lord spoke to him. This is powerful. And I think in verse 11, it says that following night, the Lord stood near Paul. And this is what the Lord said to him. Take courage. Uh, As you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you also will testify in Rome. I mean, this is, this is, this is powerful. Um, Uh, We also see, uh, you know, Jesus saying this, take, take courage in Matthew chapter 27. It says, but Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I do not be afraid. And this is Matthew chapter 27. And in the midst of difficulties, in the midst of challenges, what is Jesus saying? Take courage. Um, as you testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify me. Uh, and, and I think this is unique for Paul for a simple reason that, um, he is, he never was with the, um, when Jesus did his ministry, he was never with him. Um, he only interacted with the resurrected Lord. And, um, so when you think about Paul's passion, his zeal for the gospel message, his zeal to teach and proclaim the gospel. Um, He was more passionate and zealous, it seems like, than any of the apostles, but yet he was never with the apostles when they were with Jesus. And I think I can only speculate here, um, and it is just speculation, that Jesus just said, "I, I I gotta do a little something special for him in light of what he's going to have to go through. The barriers he's going to have to break are very different than even what Peter had. Peter and the other apostles, their mainstay uh, missionary work was to the Jews. But Paul was going to have to go to both Jews and Gentiles and deal with disruptions within the church about uh, issues of the law. That was that was a lot. And that's a lot for him to bear up under and not have been with the living Christ during his, his, his ministry that three and a half years or so. So I think what Jesus did is gave him a little something extra. Uh, one, he got to see the resurrected Lord in his glory. You remember when Peter and those guys saw him, he looked just like he did before he left. But when Paul saw him, it was brilliant in light. Why? He had taken the throne. He had, you know, so it's powerful. 
uh, we see that. Now, in this particular case, it doesn't give us a description of what he looked like, but he says that following night, the Lord stood near Paul. And that's, I mean, I, I love that phrase, he stood near Paul. I mean, imagine what Paul is feeling. Uh, here he is in front of that same group that executed Jesus. You know, um, you know, Ananias, the, the, the priest, right? The high priest. We had Caiaphas was the other one, right? And now here it is the night of, and what is, I mean, Jesus knows, uh, what, um, what Paul's feeling emotionally because he was there. He knows the, 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 the overwhelming feelings, right? Jesus said he was overwhelmed to the point of death. He understood. The other thing that we also know is that when Jesus was feeling it, who, who showed up? Well, it says that Moses and Elijah, and what were they doing? They were giving him encouragement about his departure, right? He needed someone to stand there with him. He got Moses and Elijah. And now here's Paul, you know, feeling like, man, these people are going to tear. He's been beaten. They're about to tear him limb from limb. And he's feeling it. He's all alone. And then now here comes Jesus and stands with him and gives him what? Some encouragement. He says, take courage. He, he, he's standing with him there that night. I love that night. The Lord stood near him. Did he stay there all night with him? I mean, wow, that, what a powerful image. And, and I think God is also conveying to us, what are you going through? What are you going through in your life right now? Don't you fret. I will stand next to you. Wow. I mean, that, that's just powerful that, that, that the Lord will stand next to you. You know, when you're feeling overwhelmed, when you're feeling that sense of loneliness or overwhelmed trepidation, or you are going through something that you cannot control. Think of this passage that night. And you know, when it really happens to a lot of times, it's that night, it's some of the loneliest times, right? You just, you, you, you can't get over it emotionally. And I, and I love this. It says the Lord stood near Paul. And I think, yes, Paul needed it. He needed the encouragement. He said, take courage, right? But I think this is also written clearly for us. Take courage. Yeah, it, things get bleak. This is not a situation that is, uh, looking like a blessing from God, right? He's been beaten earlier. We read in, uh, the chapters earlier. He was beaten. <laughs> then he's left uh, uh, with these folks, and they're going to tear him from limb from limb, right? And now he's in the barracks. It's not like anything is looking good. And Jesus and Jesus just stood by. And, and I love the fact that it doesn't seem like Jesus told him anything other than, as you have testified here, you must also testify in Rome. Now, here and he got to go to Rome. He's like, I'm going to make my appeal to go to the Roman emperor, you know, and he's like, that's not going to end well. And, and then it just says, Jesus just stood near. I, I think, you know, he didn't give him any insight on that. He didn't give him any comfort that you're not going to die or anything like that. He just said, he just stood near him. And sometimes, you know, we just got to be okay with God not telling us or revealing everything to us, but being comforted and knowing he stands near us. God stands near us. The Lord stands near us. That is a powerful, powerful statement for me. Verse, verse 12 of Acts chapter 23 it says, The next morning some Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they killed Paul. Wow. These people, they're not playing around. Uh, they made a vow. We're not going to eat or drink until this dude is dead. Verse 13, more than 40 men were involved in this plot. You got 40 people. You know how some people say, oh, some people are saying things about you. And it's usually like two people, three people. <laughs> this is 40 people. 40. They're not going to eat or drink until this man is dead. More than 40 men were involved in this plot. They went to the chief priests and the elders and said, 
We have taken a solemn oath not to eat anything until we have killed Paul. Now then, you and the Sanhedrin petition uh, the commander to bring him before you on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about his case. We are ready to kill him before he gets here. Now, who's he, who are they conspiring with? They're conspiring with the chief priests. This is the Sadducees. It's not the Pharisees. Some have contended that the Pharisees didn't want Jesus dead, that it was the Sadducees. It's a decent argument. I mean, I, you know, haven't really studied that out, but it does seem kind of, mm, this makes sense. But here you have these guys go and they say, bring him here on a false pretense. We see the motive. They just want him dead. Verse 16. But when the son of Paul's sister heard of this plot, he went into the barracks and told Paul. The son of Paul's sister heard of this plot. Do you understand family was involved? You know, a lot of times we don't see this stuff, but there it is right there. The son of Paul's sister heard of this plot. He went into the barracks and told Paul. So he comes in, he got to go into the barracks, told Paul, this is the son. These are people <laughs> that are around. It's pretty cool. Verse 17. Then Paul called one of the centurions and said, Take this young man to the commander. He has something to tell him. So he took him to the commander. The centurion said, Paul, the prisoner, sent for me and asked me to bring this young man to you because he has something to tell you. The commander took the young man by the hand, drew him aside and asked, what is it you want to tell me? You can tell this is a young kid. Uh, his uncle's getting ready to get killed, right? I mean, this is pretty cool. Verse 20, he said, Some Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul before the Sanhedrin tomorrow on the pretext of wanting a more accurate information about him. But don't give in to them because more than 40 of them are waiting in ambush for him. They have taken an oath not to eat or drink until they have killed him. They are ready now, waiting for your consent to their request. The commander dismissed the young man uh, with this warning. Don't tell anyone that you have reported this to me. This is powerful. You've got this young kid, and you can tell he's really, really young. And you know he's really young because he was able to sit and secretly hear what these folks were going to do. And they didn't pay any attention to him because he was that young. Man, what a faithful young man. What a brave young man. Um, you know, faith and courage is infectious. And this is his sister's son, Paul's sister's son. His uncle, he knew about him. He, he watched him. He saw the faith of him and the courage of him. And this young kid is like, I want to be like my uncle, right? <laughs> you know, people are watching your life. Are you inspiring courage? Are you inspiring faith to the next generation? Are you inspiring a courage that's willing to put themselves in danger for the cause? Are you inspiring this sense of uh, duty, this sense of this is worth it, the message is worth it? Wow. Wow. Very, very powerful here in every way. Uh, and you just got to look at this and just be inspired. And this is, this is our duty to pass on this faith. This is our duty to stand up immense, uh, great persecution and great resistance, right? That's what we do. The, uh, so the commander dismissed him. Don't tell anyone. Verse 23. Then he called two of his centurions and ordered them, get ready a detachment of 200 soldiers, <laughs> 70 horsemen, and two, are you kidding me? 200 spearsmen to go to Caesarea at nine tonight, provide horses for Paul so that he may be taken safely to Governor Felix. <laughs> you know, you, you gotta, I mean, listen at this. Get a detachment ready. How many soldiers? 200 soldiers. 70 horsemen. 
and 200 spearsmen. So you got 470 folks escorting Paul safely out. 470. Uh, are you serious? Roman soldiers? The thing that's powerful is what happened the night before. Jesus didn't tell Paul what was going to happen. Jesus just stood by him and said, take courage. <laughs> oh, man. I just go, wait a minute. Can you believe this? Oh, Daniel, you're too funny. <laughs> I mean, listen, I mean, are you serious? 200 soldiers, 200 spearsmen, 70 horsemen, 470 folks. And, and Jesus, and, and the night before, what did Jesus do? Jesus stood by him and said, take courage. He ain't tell him what was going on. He ain't tell him what was going to happen. He didn't tell him how he was going to fix it. 470 soldiers provide horsemen for Paul. That's why the prisoner's not going to walk behind him. He's going to ride on a horse. God is using a bunch of pagans to protect his investment in the apostle Paul. Wow. You know, God didn't tell him how, what he was going to do. The Lord didn't tell him, here's how I'm going to fix it. You know, a lot of times God's just not going to tell you what he's got going on. He's not going to tell you which way he's going to fix things. He's just not going to, but he's got it. He's got it. And I think that, that what is he calling on us? The issue is faith. And that's where we got to hold on. So to watch the letter, verse 25, he wrote a letter as follows. Claudius, Lysias, to his excellency, Governor Felix, greetings. This man was seized by the Jews and they were about to kill him. But I came with my troops to rescue him. You notice he says, I came to rescue him. The Lord sent him. <laughs> For I had learned that he was a Roman citizen. I wanted to know why they were accusing him. So I brought him to the Sanhedrin. I found that the accusations have to do with questions about their law. So what is it? They were going over the word of God. But there was no charge against him that deserves death or imprisonment. When I was informed of a plot to, to be carried out against the man, I sent him to you at once. I also ordered his accusers to present to you their case against him. Verse 31. So the soldiers carried out the, their orders, took Paul with them during the night and brought him as far as Antipatris. The next day, uh, they let the cavalry go on with him while they returned to the barracks. When the cavalry arrived in Caesarea, they delivered the letter to the governor and handed Paul over to him. The governor read the letter and asked what providence, what province, sorry, uh, he was from. Learning that he was from Cilicia, Cilicia he said, I will hear your case when your accusers get here. Then he ordered that Paul be kept under guard in Herod's palace. Wow. Acts chapter 23. Powerful, powerful, powerful. Isn't this amazing? Isn't this incredible? You know, when you look at this, it, it, it's just a, it's just an amazing text and you get so much out of 23, you get the family aspect with Paul's sister's son. You see the, the sheer courage that was given. Oh, thanks for the roses, queen. I appreciate it. So thankful. Um, you see that faith was transferable to family. We see Paul's sister, probably a disciple of Jesus. We see the young boy courageously standing up for what he knew to be true. We see the uh, uh, Pharisees going, mm. We just, we can't find anything wrong with what he's saying, but yet not being disciples. So we see that there can be factual truths, factual evidence out there, but yet faith not being there. Understand that faith does not come by sight. It does not come by sight. But understand, we can have the truth. We can have factual evidence, but yet people still not agree. But we also see the tension. The doctrinal tension between the Sadducees and the Pharisees, but yet we still see the courage of Paul. And here he is being beaten, almost torn apart. And there he is all alone, 
being shackled and yet the Lord standing by him. We see that God stands by us. He may not tell us what he's going to do or how he's going to do it, but the Lord is standing by us in some of our worst situations. The worst situations, the Lord is standing by us. And then we see God moving through these paganistic individuals to protect Paul with 470 soldiers to usher him in, if you will, safely. Wow. Acts chapter 23, a powerful, powerful chapter here in the book of Acts. <clears throat> I hope this has been encouraging. Hey, if you like what you're hearing, please go ahead and follow. Go ahead, click the follow. It helps out the channel, helps me out with what I'm trying to do. Uh, I think a lot of people don't follow, but please go follow. That way, whenever I go live, you will be notified. Uh, thank oh thanks for the gift really appreciate it wiggle wiggle butts <laughs> I love that <laughs> thanks so much for the gift so appreciate it but it helps out me the channel through the algorithm with the followers that way when I post things like I post things pretty much every day a little tidbits a little insights apologetics scripture uh, stuff you'll get notified with that as well in addition to that it helps the algorithm because then it's going to find like-minded people like yourself and say, hey, do you want, are you interested in this kind of material? And my goal is to really put out there uh, just great uh, biblical studies. I want to put out biblical insight into these things uh, because I feel like a lot of times we're just not well equipped with knowledge of the scriptures. Um yeah, I could do that at some point. Uh, but that's 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 how. Uh, oh, thank you, thank you for the. Uh, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thank you, V Creed, Cred. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. But yeah, so I I, I just want to get that stuff out there because I find a lot of times what we generally listen to are sermons, and sermons are great. I, I don't have a qualm against a sermon, but a sermon usually is you know, three points in a poem, right? <laughs> and it only uses a small section of passages usually. It, it's needed. Preaching is right. Preaching is biblical, and it's right. But the Bible also puts a great emphasis on teaching as well. It, 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 it talks about this idea of teaching. Why? Because teaching grounds us in certain principles that enable us to navigate life. Preaching sometimes is for what? Correcting, rebuking, right? It is for uh, inspiration, right? It is. But teaching grounds us in some principles, foundational principles that we can stand on so that we're not shifted. Uh, you know, so that that's that's why I try and do that. And and I don't think we have enough teaching out there, I'm, you know, especially on social media. This, this form, I don't think we have enough. And there's so much out there to the negative. Um, <clears throat> yep, show one approved, right? Um, the, the, there's so much negative stuff out there and the negative stuff that is out there is, is not even accurate. It's just not accurate. They, people make accusations. They make statements that are just not true. They're not true at all. They, and they, and they always want to go down this vein of, uh, you don't, you don't have any evidence and, and, and they neglect the research that is out there. There's an enormous amount of research out there to the contrary of what they're saying, and they ignore it. They ignore it, and they make statements uh, that are so out there, that are so contrary to true historical study, and, and people don't know that. And so I am combating that. I am putting uh, this form together to combat the lies and the deceit that is really out there about historical evidences of Jesus and Christianity. In addition to that, biblical doctrinal unsoundness that's out there, statements that are out there that are just not biblical. Uh, well, the thinker, we just finished up Acts chapter 23, and I was reiterating why I've started this channel and what my goals are here, and it's to be grounded in God's Word. I just feel like People teach things that are just not biblical that are out there. They make statements about 
the Bible that are just not true, that are not founded on any real evidence or research. Uh, thank you, Boom Boom. I appreciate that. Uh, thank you, Sean. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Roderick, thank you. Appreciate it. You know, we, we've got to be men and women that are really grounded in the Word of God, that this is where uh, we, we, we make our, our fortress, right, is in God's Word. And, and in order to do that, we've got to be individuals that give ourselves wholly to reading and studying the Bible. And the thing that I'm really blown away by is that you guys are here every morning at 7 a.m. I mean, that, 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 that just blows my mind. And some of you uh, are out in Minnesota, <laughs> right, Bridgie? I mean, you're on a different time and you're here every morning. And I just, I, I applaud, that's the kind of vigorous uh, energy we all need to be putting in uh, to our time with God, that we need to be reading uh, large amounts of the scriptures. Queen as well, always here. California, oh my goodness, Alabama, all you guys, uh, I, 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 this is, this is good. Uh, that's okay. And if you have a hard time, that's why I upload this on YouTube. Uh, Stephanie, oh, Texas, again, you guys are, I mean, it's just a blow away. All of you coming. This is right. This is right. And we need to do this and we need to instill it in the next generation as well. Right? Dallas, the Bronx, Chi-Town, Louisiana. I mean, Miss Mississippi. My wife's from Mississippi. Columbus, Mississippi. Tennessee, Arkansas. Wow. Uh, Ohio. All these places. Look, Georgia. We need to turn Illinois. Lancaster. Come on. Come on. Reese's. Uh, <laughs> licorice. <laughs> North Carolina. Uh, I mean, wow. New Mexico. Wow, North Carolina. Cape Verde. <laughs> Folks are like, what is Cape Verde? Ah, go look it up. It's really awesome. <laughs> Athens, Georgia. Oh, man. Oh, you would love for Ruby to join in. Okay, I have to ask her. I have to get my wife to join on in. I'll see if she if she wants to do it. We'll do a special thing. I, I gotta get her to I gotta get her to do it. <laughs> That'd be cool. <laughs> Uh, you know, us teaching together, you know, that's when, that's when it tests your marriage unity, right? Uh, if, if the, if the married couple could do something together, uh, Oklahoma, awesome. But again, and what I want, from, take what you're learning. Yes, New England, take what you're learning and turn around and teach others as well. That, that, you know, you said, well, I can't teach like you. Take one nugget. Take, one nugget, write it down, understand that one nugget, and then go share that with your friends, family, coworkers, those in your community. We want to be a, a group that can turn things around. We're, we're usually about 100 people. Uh, my YouTube is at Chip Mitchell 23, at Chip Mitchell 23. Demetrius, my man. Ah, there he is. This guy's a phenomenal man of God. He's a phenomenal teacher of relationships. Check out Demetrius. He's always putting up just incredible, insightful uh, things that I, I really love. He, he's, he's an amazing man. Uh, and I tell you, um, so what do you what do you want to do? You 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 learn these things. You share these things. And, and we're about a hundred folks, right? Well, the interesting thing is that in the first century, how did they begin? It began with about 120. It was 120 of them. They changed the world. This group of 100, this group that generally is about 100 on, on the line, we can change the world that we live in. If, if we're passionate in prayer, diligent in our study, and allowing God to transform us, we can be a transformative uh, agent for changing the narrative that's out there about God. You know, one by our own spirituality, growth, and maturity that we embrace what God has called us to be as disciples of Jesus. And then number two, that we do our due diligence in God's word, sharing it as God has intended us to share it, transforming the narrative that is out there that so much, so often is twisted and rejecting. And, and that's what we can do. And, and I believe God can use this very powerfully. Uh, think of Jesus. Oh, somebody asked the question, why doesn't he show up once a year? At least somebody was saying that about Jesus. You know, that's, you know, that's a great question. I know that um, people ask that. How did it go when Jesus was living? 
<laughs> it didn't go well. Um, it really didn't go well. Um, they killed him. Uh, it wasn't like when he was there that it fixed everybody. It didn't. Um, it, it just didn't. Um, and again, um, the issue is an issue of faith. It's not an issue of evidence. And, and that's where I think people get messed up is that they think, well, if Jesus would just come down and do it in front of me, it would fix me. No, it wouldn't. It didn't. When he was here, it didn't. It didn't. It just, they killed him. Um, they killed him. Uh, it had a, uh, some, some large gatherings of folks with the miracles, but those miracles did not create um, a change, a wave in the culture. It, it just led to his death. And I think we've, we've got to understand that. Uh, that, that that's, a, that's a reality. That's a harsh reality. And um, yeah, it's very challenging. Um, do you teach that we have a helper in the Holy Spirit? Yes, to assist and we cannot come up with words. Yeah, the Bible, I mean, Jesus talks about, hey, don't worry about it. When he spoke to the apostles, he said, don't worry about it. The Holy Spirit is going to give you words to speak. Now, was that just to the apostles or was that to us as well? Don't know. The Bible's a little vague on it. But what I do know is that when we read passages like Acts 23, the Lord stands by us and the Lord will help us. The Holy Spirit will guide us unto all truths, right? It, it, it will. It will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. That's what we know. That's what we can be confident of. But when I speak, are these the words of the Holy Spirit? That's a hard one for me to grab onto. I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go that far. Uh, but I will say that the Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come, and it does that. He shows up me daily, weekly, by the minute, by the second. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally believe that. The Holy Spirit is everywhere. The Holy Spirit is moving powerfully it intercedes for us it talks to god about what's going on in us and what we need very 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 powerful um well guys this has been a great morning uh please go to my profile page check out the things that i put up on the profile page um it helps out the uh, algorithm as far as for me to promote the different things that i'm doing we're finding people daily if you have not followed please click i'm asking you Click the follow. Please click the follow right now. Also, go to the YouTube page. Click subscribe. I'm going to be uploading this later on today. Uh, that way you'll have it um, and you can use it at your leisure. You can share it with your friends and family. It's raw. It's not like it's edited and all that kind of stuff. It's just not. Uh, but we're going to close out here with a prayer. I want to thank everyone for your support. Your encouragement means a lot. Let's keep on doing it. Keep praying for me. Pray that God gives me insight into what I'm doing. Uh, pray that God allows me to have the time to continue to do this that I'm doing every morning. Because now, you know, I, I leave here and then I got I got a full day planned. I, I got to head out and do, do some things. But please keep me in your prayers that God keeps giving me the energy, the faith, the stamina, and the insight into his word to continue to teach. I love doing it. I love encouraging and let's pray for those who don't believe. Let's pray that God opens the door in their heart and their mind that they may come to faith. Amen. Let's go to God. God, you're amazing in every way. We thank you so much for your word. Your word is powerful. Your word transforms us. Thank you, Father, for giving to us. Help us to gain greater insight into your text, to understand what's going on in your scriptures. And we will be encouraged by that. And help us, Father, to share our faith to reach out to those, even those who reject, uh, help us to do that in an effective way. God, you're amazing. We love you. We need you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's great uh, having you guys. It's great to see you. Have an incredible day. Please stay safe. I pray the weekend will go really well uh, for you as you head on into the weekend. Be safe. Keep God at the forefront. I'll be back, Lord willing, tomorrow morning, 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. I look forward to seeing you. We're going to jump into uh, Paul in Acts chapter 24 before Felix. It'll be a great time. Go read it. 
Maybe you have some questions about it. Uh, hopefully I can answer them. But I love doing what we get to do here every morning. You guys take care. Have a blessed day.